watch this. Ahead for you on this Friday edition of the 208. Democrats working in Republican-run states came together in our nation's capital this week, and two of Idaho's Democrats were there for a big chat. What about? Well, abortion laws around the country. We got insight from the trip to D.C. from two top Dems. Earlier this week, we showed you the start of the 8th Street Barrier Makeover. And today we have the final product, plus some of your comments on what you think about the art project and idea itself. One lion, two lion, three, oh no, just two, two lions. But that's one more than Zoo Boise had back in February. And this week, the new lion met her new roommate for the first time in the same area. We'll tell you all about it, ahead on the 208. Well, thank you so much for being with us here on your Friday. We have a variety of things to get to, but we'll start with this. A pair of Idaho lawmakers are uh, back from a trip to Washington, D.C. after accepting an invite from the Biden administration. Idaho Representative Alana Rubel and Senator Melissa Wintrow had the opportunity to meet with 47 other state lawmakers from across the country. Common theme here. They're Democrats working in Republican-controlled states, and specifically, they all met to discuss the current abortion laws in their states. The U.S. Supreme Court's Dobbs decision struck down federally protected abortion nearly a year ago now, overturning Roe v. Wade, and it erased 50 years of precedent. And Idaho is one of 14 states that now ban most abortions. A state by state, the Democrats say that they're working to push that line. Here's our Andrew Bartline. Since states regained their right to regulate abortion, Democratic Senator Melissa Wintrow Correct. and Representative Elena Rebell say they've lost rights as a consequence. Um, Idaho is, in fact, the worst. People are not imagining it. Idaho law says most abortions are illegal. Exceptions exist for rape with a police report, incest, or to quote, prevent the death of a pregnant woman. It dawned on us that we actually in Idaho are the worst in the worst of the states across the country as far as limitations and just really restrictive laws. We have total abortion bans where some other folks have at least up to 12 weeks. I mean, many of the laws that get run through Idaho have already been run through Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, uh, Florida, Missouri, you name it. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense for all of us who are facing similar challenges to get together and see how it's playing out and if anybody has any great ideas on how to battle back. We're seeing a loss of health care access that really eclipses um, even the reddest of other states. Uh, so we, we, we have an extreme emergency in Idaho that um, exceeds anywhere in the nation. Did other states say, yeah, we have this problem too and we also are attributing it to the same reasons that you folks are? Did that happen? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Every, everybody is seeing that. Um, there did seem to be um, a severity in Idaho that other states aren't seeing yet. We've already lost 45% of our fetal maternal medicine specialists. We know that these policies that are being passed are wildly unpopular all over the country and it'll have consequences. But they're totally legal. The Idaho State Supreme Court upheld Idaho's abortion laws in January, writing in summary, quote, if the people of Idaho are dissatisfied with these new laws, they can elect new legislators. If the Republican Party is the party that's out of touch and not representative of the people, it's hard for me to pallet that when they keep winning. They're the ones that keep getting elected. We've done polling in this state that um, a over, well over a majority of people believe that the legislature has gone too far and they're not representing everyday kitchen table topics. So um, yeah, I, I stick to that and I stick firmly to it. But it doesn't change the fact that the Republican Party tends to be the party that mm -hmm. wins throughout the state come the general election. I think there's a very strong cultural affiliation with the yes. Republican Party in Idaho. Now at some point that may wake up voters and say this issue has gotten so extreme. It's it's threatening health care access, it's driving doctors out of the state, it's threatening people's lives. Um, I'm going to shake myself up out of that reflexive party voting and maybe, you know, look at somebody who more aligns with our views on this. The view that they say abortion is a right in a state that says it's not. You know, I'm looking eyeball to eyeball at people crying, desperate and feeling dehumanized because they can't get the decent kind of care and dignity that they deserve. 
I talked to House Majority Leader Representative Megan Blanksma over the phone as well, who sponsored multiple Idaho abortion bills that have since become law. She agrees with that Supreme Court summary. If you don't like the laws, she says, take it up at the ballot box. Representative Blanksma adds the Republicans have actually taken seats the last few election cycles from the Democrats as well. And in terms, Joe, of nurses, doctors, OBGYNs, leaving the state. Blanksma says in her conversations with these uh, professionals that it's clarity that they're concerned about. Toward the end of the session, she had a bill that she worked to hopefully clear up some of that confusion in those laws, and perhaps there's more work to be done there, but from her perspective, those problems boil down to clarity. What is that firm line between what is legal, what is not legal? She says that's the solution. And I think it'll be interesting over the next several years in Idaho and beyond to see, you know, how that issue is tailored because we know that, you know, lawmakers, they came back this past session to take a look at the abortion laws. I think in January, there's a good chance that you'll likely see some abortion or abortion adjacent conversations as well. I'm not sure it's going away anytime soon. We'll see next session. All right, Andrew, thanks for the report. We'll talk soon. It's not, it's not just your region. It's not just your state. It's worldwide. You instantly bond with people because you're all out there doing the same job. You know, it might be slightly different from spot to spot, but we're all doing the same thing and we do it for a reason. Jasmine was able to come home after helping fight the fires burning throughout Canada, but the fires are still going strong from west to east there. So the National Interagency Fire Center, or NIFSI, is sending more United States firefighters. Now, NIFSI is headquartered in Boise, and eight different agencies collaborate through the center. They're the country's main support system for wildfires. Now, Canada asked for aviation assets like air tankers and smoke jumpers, so NIFSI is helping fulfill that request. If you didn't know, this Sunday is Father's Day, so if you haven't gotten a gift card or blocked off some time to call your dad, you should probably do that right now or right after the 208. But here on the 208 on Friday, we wanted to take a moment to honor the men who helped raise us. So throughout the show, you're going to get to meet my dad, Jeff, Andrew's dad, Tim, and our producer, Katie's dad, Don. But first up, let's talk about my dad, Jeffrey Parrish, CPA. This is my dad and his, uh, his great office in downtown Boise. And I want to say that the older I get, the more I appreciate everything my dad has done for me and my family. He teaches me that hard work is really what it's about. Taking care of the people around you, that's, that's what it's about. And also, being a huge Denver sports fan. My dad was at the uh, Denver Nuggets parade this week after they won the world championship and he shared his love for University of Colorado and Denver Bronco football with me growing up and a big Elton John fan as well. And dad, I know you're watching uh, here tonight in uh, Denver, Colorado. Here's with my whole family. I love you so much. You're my hero. I look up to you. Thank you so much. And a happy Father's Day to all the other dads out there. We're going to get to more of this later on in the show. Major transformation over the last few years on 8th Street in Boise. No cars allowed in this spot. Well, for the most part, at least. The orange markers, though, they've transformed too. And they're now finished for final viewing. We'll give you a look. Plus, we are getting ready for Father's Day on Sunday here on the 208. We want to see your favorite dad pictures and maybe a few of the life lessons you learned from your dad. So text us. Our number, 208-321-5614. Please be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to share some of your pictures and lessons coming up at the end of the show.
As a part of a pilot program, 8th Street will close down from Maine to Bannock to host social distance dining. We'll have drawings very soon, and we expect that they'll be on the sidewalk, and then the streets will become the way that people can move easily. Oh, yes, the COVID era. Remember, we used to report from home. But yeah, another consequence of the COVID pandemic and a couple of sections of 8th Street have remained. Not so much a street, but a big wide open sidewalk for people to meander. Now, three years it's been this way, according to the Downtown Boise Association. Pedestrian only since June of 2020. And we've dealt with the big orange barriers for that long, too. Kind of an eyesore if you ask people, but the DBA says they have a purpose. It's to stop blind people or anyone with low vision from wandering into the busy streets of Maine and Idaho. They were and are supposed to be temporary. And in the meantime, one local Boise artist is adding some other colors to the monochromatic canvas. We told you about it earlier this week, but we got a good response from you. So we're going to show you the work that's being done, and then we'll also show you how it ended up. Andrew, take it away. It surrounds downtown Boise. The sounds, the detours, the orange. This is a really nice little street here that I don't think people want to confuse construction with um, art. The art. So we add all our colors. Organized. And then we add our outlines. By Bobby Gaetan. And so it's a fill outline con process. It's a process made possible by the Downtown Boise Association. So they could see some, some different other than construction right now with all the orange and flags and signs. Because despite a few signs, 8th Street isn't under construction, even though it's donning the same blockades. Now turned to canvas. Plastic, it's got all these ridges. It's a team effort between Bobby Touch -ups if those are and his assistant Dana to draw a line between the two. Yeah, we call this one the blob. Makes some really nice crisp lines. Easy line works that you can, you know, um, that we can manage in, considering our time. Oh, I think a lot of folks agree that it's been a an upgrade to what, what was already there. And it's already getting noticed. I actually did. Right here. Um, is it just this one? Randy Anderson spotted it immediately. Oh my gosh. And there? Yeah. She saw that too. Yeah, that's so cool. The art. It's starting to surround Boise too. I think it's also really cool that it's a local Boise artist. And that's so cool to be able to look at that instead of a big orange atrocity. <laughs> An atrocity that evidently has at least one big fan by way of another atrocity. And there was one guy who came by and was like, mm, it's OK, they're not curing leukemia. Like, I don't know why that has to be either or. The real either or is construction or pedestrians only. You kind of move the can around so you could cover those little round edges. Drawing a line between the two. It, it's a very <laughs> challenging canvas for sure. Showing that maybe surrounding eighth, there's something in the orange. It's welcoming. A lot of times people come to a city and they see the art and they if they can connect to the city they feel they feel comfortable and they feel welcomed and I think that's a good way to, to look at it. Downtown Boise Association said eventually the city will put down those blister like bumpy strips on the crosswalk to help people with low to no vision. They're usually yellow, you know the kind. Now they are technically called truncated domes and detectable warning pavers so that the pavement can be felt. But for now the barriers are there and uh, they're a lot more beautiful and you think so too. Remember these comments? Well, you don't remember them because we just got them. Scott said, I love the new artwork on 8th Street barriers, but I also have noticed more unnecessary graffiti throughout the city that I have not seen before. I hope we do not see this graffiti on the artwork. Ken and Eagle said, I love the way the Boise artists are painting the ugly orange barriers. How about a paint off with all the towns in the Treasure Valley competing for the most awesome construction barriers? Uh, I like that one a lot. Great idea. And then Bobby and his team finished up painting the barriers just yesterday. And as you can see, they are looking really good. Great job, Bobby, and everyone who helped. Where do I start with Tim Thomas? Well, we met in the 90s. It was a good decade for Cougar football, but he taught me a lot more than just praying for a Rose Bowl. My dad showed me the importance of taking on responsibility and through hardships, losing a battle. He taught me not to lose myself and mostly never losing sight of the moments that truly matter to make time for those you love. For a holiday founded in our hometown of Spokane, happy Father's Day, Dad. Kids are out of school, weather is nice, you better get to Zoo Boise. Over at the zoo, there is a new animal to see, a queen of the jungle, you can say. 
She joins the established Boise King of the Jungle. So, how do zookeepers ensure that this duo will get along? Zoo Boise director Gene Peacock joins us for the insight. And yes, we're getting ready for Father's Day. Keep those pictures and life lessons coming. We're going to share some of them at the end of the show. Get your submission in, 208-321-5614. Include your name and hashtag the 208, and we'll see you on the other side. Well, I hope you're enjoying your start to the weekend. I wouldn't have blamed you if you decided to play a little bit of hooky today because it's pretty pleasant outside. We've got temperatures in the 60s in some mountain locations near 80 over in Boise. Yes, we do have a little bit of the smoke and haze, but overall still shaping up for some really nice conditions. Here's what's going on this weekend. We're not going to continue to see the sunshine throughout the whole weekend. Starting tomorrow, we're going to see some clouds start to build in ahead of a system that's going to bring us some showers on Sunday. So tomorrow's high is still going to be warm at 84 degrees and then we cool down as a cold front works its way in and that's what's going to bring us those showers as well. If we look at what that means for the mountains, it's a similar situation for Saturday where the clouds are going to build in. I think we could still see some chances of light showers in the evening hours and those temperatures are still going to stay nice and comfortable. But then Sunday we have a more concentrated chance of seeing rain showers in our mountain locations and then we're seeing that temperature drop there as well. So here's one model's prediction of how those showers are expected to play out. You can see staying really light up until around Saturday at 830. So tomorrow night we start to see that cold front work its way in. Some of the strongest showers are going to be towards the northwest as the cold front works into the southeast. You can see some of those chances are going to be around central mountain areas. And then as we go into the overnight hours, we expect those showers to continue. And at our highest elevations, we are talking about snow in the morning of Sunday. So some of those showers picking up a little bit of steam again around four o'clock or so. But then we start to see that wind down in those mountain locations and start to shift a little bit more to the southeast over towards Jerome and Twin Falls for an afternoon chance of those showers. Here's your seven day forecast and you can see it's a bit of a temperature roller coaster where we start at 84 degrees on Saturday and then dipping into the 60s on Monday and Tuesday.
Thank you, Sophia. Looking good. Well, it's good weather to hit the zoo. So the next time you go to Zoo Boise, there's something new and really exciting for you to see. Two lions are now together after working through an important introduction period. The new two-year-old female named Ahsoka is on exhibit with Revan, the zoo's 10-year-old male African lion. Ahsoka was born in November 2020 at the Santa Barbara Zoo and came to Zoo Boise in March of this year. You can see her there. The lioness was paired with Revan because of the zoo's species survival plan. In the introduction of the lions, known as the Howdy's process, well, partner, it's a hard pressure environment for zookeepers. Zoo Boise director Gene Peacock has the insight. You, you have a way to do it, but you, the animals dictate it somewhat. If, if, if the animals don't get along initially, the howdy process, which by howdy we mean they're in dens next to each other and there's mesh next to them, but they're not together. So they can see each other, hear each other, smell each other. In some cases, maybe touch each other, but not where they can, can hurt each other. So that process will go as long as the animal care team thinks is necessary. And then once they get to the point they're comfortable with everything, they'll, uh, they'll let them out in the yard here. And um, when, we, when we do the actual full introduction, we have a lot of staff in place. We did it early in the morning um, this past Monday. And we have staff in place. We let her out first, then we let him out. And you watch and see what happens. Um, some of the safety precautions, some noise makers, uh, hoses, things like that to distract them if they were to fight. A few little cat bites, you know, just kind of pawing at each other and all that, but within 20, 20 minutes or so, they had settled down. They were together day one for probably four or five hours, then the next day a little longer, and then uh, yesterday they were out all day together, and it's to the point that uh, our female, she likes to sneak up behind Revan sometimes, and she'll, she'll nip him on his butt, and he takes off running and is like, what are you doing? And so they're now that they're used to each other, we're starting to see the play. Day one, he was on one side of the yard and she was on another. By the end of the day, they were a little closer. And as they get used to each other, now they're, they're like a normal pair of lines. It is nerve wracking because you can plan and plan and prepare and go over the scenarios. But the reality of it is, is if something were to go wrong, we can't go in that exhibit. It's too dangerous. And so that's why the howdy process and the period leading up to that is so, so important. You have to have a great team in place, which we've got an amazing team of zookeepers. Um, and they really observe the animals, they understand their behavior, and they're the ones that'll dictate where they think the time is right. Zoo Boise guests may see the brand new lion and the one that's been there for a little while during zoo hours from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily. Pro tip from the zookeepers, early in the day is when the lions will likely be more active with their enrichment. Well, we've been talking about Father's Day, but there's another holiday coming up this weekend, Juneteenth. So why is Juneteenth on June 19th? Well, because on June 19th, back in 1865, Union troops went to Galveston Bay, Texas with the news of freedom, nearly two years after President Abraham Lincoln had emancipated slaves. More than 250,000 African Americans embraced freedom on June 19th, which is also called Freedom Day. Now, Juneteenth became a federally recognized holiday on June 17th by President Joe Biden. Excuse me, that was in uh, 2001. Uh, looking for a local way to celebrate, head to Juneteenth Boogie tonight at 7 at the Linen Building in downtown Boise. Get ready to dance the night away to good music at the completely free party, including free food. Anyone is welcome to come boogie. Just make sure to RSVP on Eventbrite. Also happening right now, it's the Juneteenth Farmer's Market. You can head over to the Global Lounge Commons located at 3085 North Coal Road to pick up some fresh produce while celebrating the community and culture here in the Treasure Valley. There'll be a lot of local food vendors and some delicious food, and there'll be some activities for the kids, including a bounce house. Started at 5, and it goes till 9 p.m. tonight. There are countless things that I can thank my dad for. Thank you for the basics, like teaching me how to hang a picture, mow the lawn, how to budget. But the biggest thing that he taught me is to be kind. He's the nicest person I know. He never talks about anyone. He's accepting of everyone. And he can make a random stranger his friend in minutes. And trust me, he does this all the time. That is how I want to go about my life, with the same love and kindness that my dad does. Happy Father's Day, Dad.
All right, let's get to some of your comments and thoughts. Uh, this person says, hey, Joe, why doesn't abortion be put on a ballot so that people can really decide? Wouldn't that solve the problem we're having now? That's from Dale. Dale, you never know. We could see that in the future. Uh, this person says, thank you, Boise artists. You changed blah to beauty in downtown Boise. Thank you so much, Phyllis, for that message. This person says, to our stepdad, Glenn Weeks, you have shown us love, kindness, support, and have overall been a great dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather. We love you. Oh, we love all these messages coming in about Father's Day, like this one. My dad, his kindness and humor knew no bounds. Happy Father's Day. Miss you. Hashtag the 208. And this person says, even though our dad is gone, every Father's Day brings a greater appreciation for all that he was and did for our family. Love you, Dad. Great example, Elmore County. That's Denver. And uh, again, shout out to my dad watching in downtown Denver, not in downtown Boise. Everyone have a great weekend.